God in our scripture reading from Luke 16, verses 1 through 13, from the Common English Bible. Jesus also said to the disciples, a certain rich man heard that his household manager was wasting his estate. He called the manager in and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give me a report of your administration because you can no longer serve as my manager. The household manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is firing me as his master, manager? I am not strong enough to dig and too proud to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I'm removed from my management position, people will welcome me into their houses. One by one, the manager sent for each person who owed his master money. He said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, 900 gallons of olive oil. The manager said to him, take your contract, sit down quickly and write 450 gallons. The, ma the manager said to another, how much do you owe? He said, 1,000 bushels of wheat. He said, take your contract and write 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted cleverly. People who belong to this world are more clever in dealing with their peers than are people who belong to the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to make friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful with little is also faithful with much. And the one who is dishonest with little is also dishonest with much. If you haven't been faithful with worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? If you haven't been faithful with someone else's property, who will give you your own? No household servant can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be loyal to the one and have contempt for the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The word of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Almost every scholar I consulted to help make sense of this story started by saying this is the strangest, most confounding, and perplexing, and most difficult of all of Jesus' parables to understand. Good luck. <laughs> Phyllis Tickle, highly respected scholar, she said, oh no, is it really time for that parable again? <laughs> it comes around every three years, and most years I look to see what other options I may have in the lectionary. And you know that many parables are repeated in other Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke often contain the same parables, sometimes told in slightly different ways, depending on the audience or purpose. But what does it say that Matthew and Mark took a pass on this parable? <laughs> so, six of us gathered to eat noodles on Thursday for lunch, and our practice is to read three different translations to ourselves as we eat and then discuss. And this week, I watched each person finish reading with a, what? Look <laughs> on their face. Because this text raises a lot more questions than answers. So it starts by Jesus telling his disciples that an accusation has been made against the household manager of a certain rich man. And you know his income came from taking a cut of his bosses, which is not an unusual practice. So maybe somebody thought he was taking too much and tried to get him in trouble by telling the rich man he was squandering his property. And most focus on the alleged dishonesty of this manager. But I want to go back and ask first, how did this rich man get so rich? And what had he done to stay so rich? So as the text begins, it, it's a little odd, yeah, but it's, it's okay saying, well, we can work with this somehow. And that is until we come to its most perplexing line. Kathy read, use worldly wealth to make friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into the eternal homes. Okay, so that's a little weird, but the New Revised Standard Translation of the same verse isn't just weird, it's offensive. 
it says, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth. Now, surely an editorial error was made by somebody somewhere along the way. Because <laughs> Jesus would never say anything like that. And if he did, then we got to ask why. So what do you think of when you hear the phrase, dishonest wealth? I mean, I can't help myself but think about <laughs> emolument clauses <laughs> and the small business people who are contracted to build and furnish casinos in Atlantic City and golf courses in Florida and probably everywhere else. And when they went to collect their money, they were told they would have to accept less. And small businesses who couldn't afford to join among 60 who sued and 200 who placed liens on properties were paid as little as 10, 20, and 30 cents on the dollar and subsequently forced out of business. Now, some will claim that was just a shrewd, clever business practice. Sadly, we could spend the next hour sharing such stories of cabinet makers in Philadelphia and drapery installers in Las Vegas and a toilet company in New Jersey. So Jesus says, that, does this have anything to do with why some Christians have made friends with people of dishonest wealth? And yet in the end, Jesus did say, if you're honest in small things, you'll be honest in big things. And if you're a crook in small things, you'll be a crook in big things. So this weird and offensive line about dishonest wealth is even more curious given that the topic Jesus talked about more than any other in the Gospel of Luke Despite the odd line about being welcomed into eternal homes, Jesus spoke of economic justice, more than heaven and the afterlife, more than healing. What does this perplexing story have to do with economic justice or justice for the poor? So the verse that immediately follows after what we heard says the Pharisees, who were money lovers, heard all this and sneered at Jesus. So if we're perplexed and confounded by this parable, somehow the Pharisees knew exactly what Jesus was saying. And they didn't like it. And then Jesus went right into a parable about Lazarus and the rich man, which is not a super popular parable among the accused money lover class either. Does it matter how this certain rich man got so rich? Was he like the man who promised God, if you solve my problems, I'll sell my house and give all the money to the poor? And one day he realized he would have to make good on that promise, so he put his house on the market for one dollar. But anyone who bought the house would also have to take his cat, which came for the bargain price of $100,000. <laughs> When the house sold, the man promptly gave everything he received from the proceeds of the sale to the poor. He hadn't said anything about the cat in his promise. So was he just being clever or shrewd? Was it dishonest or worldly wealth? Perhaps more importantly, though, what, what does any of this have to do with us? Bottom line, right? So there's, there's not a person in this room, myself included, who doesn't live a relative standard of wealth above most people in the world. We may not be guilty of something devious or have committed some crime to get it, but we certainly have some responsibility for all the access and advantages and privileges that comes with it. All of us benefit to some extent from wealth gained by dishonest practices. After all, we live, we're standing on land that was stolen from indigenous peoples. And every time a group of us travels up to the Pine Ridge Reservation, we are reminded that the United States has never kept even one treaty in order to get that wealth. From mining gold, silver, and every other mineral we want. 
You know, as the gold on the dome of the state capitol glimmers in the sun, it should serve as a reminder of the benefits we receive from dishonest wealth. We have to ask how much of the wealth of our country is derived or was derived from slave labor. In the South is rightly excoriated for the practice of owning slaves and then losing a war for the right to keep human beings enslaved. But the earnings of the plantation owners filled the banks and increased the bottom line of the whole country. Unpaid labor made cheap goods possible for everyone. Wealth grew. People made rich off slave labor, didn't have to give any of that up. Inheritance grew, except for people upon whose backs this wealth was made. And you know, given our history, I don't know why reparations is even a controversial issue. I mean, there are debts to be paid. And the price for freedom from, for the newly freed slaves was impossibly high. The former owners told them to get off their land or now pay to live in the squalid conditions that had been their home their homes, and with what were they supposed to pay rent? And a new and improved form of slavery began called sharecropping. Mm -hmm. Those emancipated were supposed to start with nothing. Although as one commentator said, I refuse to be a victim in this scheme. I am the ancestor of those who survived the worst that could be thrown at them. My answers Ancestors are the strongest. My ancestors are survivors, and so am I. Which reminds me of Maya Angelou's poem. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Out from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Yet the legacy of not even even playing field remains today. The gap between the net worth of average black and white households in the US has only continued to worsen. A greater wealth gap today by race this was hard to believe, then 1970 South Africa during apartheid. Mm -hmm. Nicholas Kristof, New York Times. Wealth buys access to a family home, and therefore credit, which generates wealth, providing such things as access to higher education. The crisis of crippling student debt will have serious long-term effects for our whole economy, but student debt is even worse, the effects for people of color. Now, this is the kind of stuff Jesus talked about all the time. Far from heaven and salvation and family values, unless you define family values as food enough for children, but he spoke of justice. Not, not retribution and retaliation, but reconciliation and redistribution. Come to think of it, also known as reparations. Jesus didn't say a single word about abortion and homosexuality, but quite clearly he said you can't serve both God and wealth. As Jesus said, you will either hate one and love the other, or you will be loyal to the one and have contempt for the other. For example, by serving wealth instead of God, homelessness will seem okay. And separating kids from their families will seem okay. And disproportionately locking up one race over another will seem okay. And drug testing hungry people before they receive help while handing out tax breaks will seem okay. Locking up celebrities like Felicity Huffman for 15 days for cheating the college entrance system while sentencing Crystal Mason, a woman of color in Texas, to five years in jail for trying to enroll her child in elementary school, well, that, that'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Now, just to be clear, it's not. But 
for those who worship wealth over God. No problem. At the end of trying to understand this confounding, perplexing enigma of a parable wrapped in a riddle, I take away one thing. More than the admonition that we can't serve God and wealth, rather, I ask in the positive, how do we use our wealth to serve God? I mean, let's just not bother with denying we have it. If we do, let's just move on. So Martin Luther King once said, time is neutral. You can use your time for good, or you can use it for evil. But liberation theologian Musa Gonzalez said, money is not neutral. It is either used for purposes that are just or purposes that are unjust. Whatever we do with our wealth, however great or small, it is of enormous importance. For we are either servants of God seeking its wise use, or servants of money always seeking more. Easy question. Are you a servant of God or are you a servant of money? <laughs> but that's a little hard to answer, isn't it? We can be wealthy in many things. We can be wealthy in friendships and family and kindness and, and acts of compassion. But this parable is about the added topic, money. That's not an anti-wealth parable. In fact, one way we should understand, we could understand it, is that we we should not be so heavenly minded that we are of no earthly good. Shrewd in the ways of the world. But not to forget as well, Jesus and his disciples depended on the wealth, especially of women, who financed his ministry. But it does invite us to ask, is financial wealth the goal of our life? Or is our focus the wise, even true, clever use of money? Again, it's not, let's not bother the money we have it. The question is, how do we use it? And whether obtained honestly or dishonestly, is your wealth making an impact upon the people Jesus loved and talked about all the time? For some people, it is giving it all away. For others, how are you using your wealth to serve God? And if you wonder, so who's God? Just remember that God is love. So we can ask the same question, how are you using your wealth to serve love?